Welcome back to another episode of Bibliophiles, a show from the Ann Arbor District Library in Michigan that's all about books. Each episode, we take a few minutes to answer one book-related question. And this time, we're looking at a great book about food. I'm Christopher, and I'm joined, as always, by Lucy and Amanda. Lucy, what book did you pick for us this time? Um, I picked a book called At the Chinese Table. It says it's a memoir with recipes, and this is by Carolyn Phillips. And it is, it's called a memoir with recipes, but it's so much more. Um, It's the story of Carolyn Phillips' life as it begins in Taipei uh, in the 70s. She wants to study abroad and she, she wants to go to Tokyo, but she ends up in Taipei. So um, she starts to learn about the food while she's there. She's always been passionate about food because even within her second year of being there, she says her Western stomach is still in revolt. So she's trying to learn about the food. Um, the second year that she's living there is also when she meets a Taiwanese man named J.H. He is a scholar, but he's teaching English to foreigners, including her. He will later become her husband. And he is also an Epicurean. So he knows a lot about food, a lot about gourmet food. And he introduces her not only to the food he grew up with, um, both of his parents are excellent cooks from different regions in China. Um, But he shows her food all over the place. And she says, deconstructing the layout of China was difficult, but food showed me the way. So she sort of learns the map of all of China and Taiwan through the regions and its food. And she starts to learn and study and practice. And um, she and JH travel all over Taiwan and China, discovering this food from different regions. They dig up old cookbooks. She cooks it all. He introduces her to all these cuisines in remote restaurants um, that like where some of China's most talented chefs are there actually in Taiwan and um, the things she learns there and the things she eats. It's like her descriptions of the food are amazing because she includes a lot of recipes that she cooks, but the, the food that she's encountering in these gourmet restaurants, it's like visually amazingly pleasing. And also there's this sort of like trickery to it a lot of the time. So, or this, It will look like something it's not, you know, like completely different. Um, Like it looks like a fish, but it's actually made out of something else, you know, and it's it's just, it's her descriptions are are really cool. And she's learning all of this and learning about the region that it's from and learning to cook it. So she cooks, tries to cook for JH, most of the things that he loves. um, And he, like he's requesting this pig's head dish that, takes days. So she keeps putting it off and putting it off. She's learning and learning all these things. Finally, she cooks it. There's a chapter about this. I mean, this is a process that takes days to cook this pig's head. But the toughest challenge that she has is um, JH's parents. So she meets them when he's still just her boyfriend and they're very kind of cold to her. And, you know, she's not uh, Taiwanese, she's not Chinese. And she starts to cook for them. They're unsure about it, but she warms um, his mother who will soon be her mother-in-law. She warms her over with some pork buns. His father is a much harder sell. He's sort of this gruff World War II vet. He's quiet, um, but eventually they form this really interesting relationship. He starts to teach her Hakka cuisine, which is the cuisine uh, from his culture. So they cook side by side. And through all these travels, She is convinced that there are 35 distinct regions in China and Taiwan. So 35 different regional cuisines, whereas like the typical hypothesis is that there are five regional cuisines in China. So she sets out to write this compendium. It's called uh, All Under Heaven. It's a huge cookbook. It won the James Beard Award in 2016, and it has food and, you know, food and descriptions about all 35 of these regions. It's really the only book like that. She lived in Taipei for about a decade and moved back um, to San Francisco and became a court interpreter, which really helped her learn um, Chinese and Mandarin, like really helped her with the language eventually because court interpreting is very complicated. But this is the book that's like the memoir of all of that. So interspersed with, with learning the recipes is um, the relationship with her husband 
it, she talks about the history of all the different regions she visits. She talks about the culture. So it's just, it's filled with um, really interesting stuff. And she's very um, respectful of her adopted culture, you know, understanding that it is adopted, but she, so she wants to learn like as authentically as she can about where she is. And the recipes are um, really cool in here. I definitely want to try and make some. There's, there's also some illustrations she does. So um, this is the memoir of that whole journey of hers and much more, much, much more. She's very funny as well, but always like towards in a self-deprecating way towards herself. So she's, you know, she, uh, so yeah, it's great. That's At the Chinese Table by Carolyn Phillips. And that's my book about food. <laughs> Amanda, what did you pick? Uh, so the book I chose has way less food. The book I chose is a teen novel called Let It Snow. And it is by John Green, Maureen Johnson, and Lauren Miracle. And they are three prolific um, authors in the teen genre. And it's called Let It Snow. It does take place at Christmas time. And it is a teen holiday romance. So if that doesn't, is that not something you normally would read or get into? Um, you can skip it. But if you like it, this book is a great fit for those for the teen holiday. And I personally don't fall into the rom-com loving, especially like teen romances. But this one, I was drawn to it because I like um, John Green's writing. And so I read it. And there are three different stories written by the three different authors. And they all intersect in some way. And I really like it when stories, and even if it's just one book written by one author, I like it when there are separate pieces that come together. And these are three separate stories, but in each of them, there's overlapping characters or um, an overlapping setting, which brings me to the food part. The overlapping setting in the stories is the Waffle House. So the story takes place at Christmas, there's a blizzard and some of the teens end up in this Waffle House. So for me, in real life and in books and just in daily living, food and food as setting or place is such a common denominator. It's like a meeting spot. It's this place you can just go to and get a coffee or have some water, have a tea, um, have a drink, have dinner. It's we meet in all of these places and food is this common denominator. Even if we're hanging out, it's like come over. The kitchen is the hot spot in our homes for like conversation and food. We bond over food. Now the kids in this book, the teenagers, they're not bonding over food. Yes, there are waffles. Yes, it takes place in a waffle house, but the stories are not completely centered around food. It's just the waffle house happens to be where um, one of the teens works there and another story, that's where the kids are meeting or end up at, and seeking solace from this blizzard. <clears throat> so in one of the stories that there's a teen who's um, going, it all takes place in the same town. One of them is sent to spend Christmas with her grandparents. So she's on a train that breaks down. And another story is more about the best friends. Um, but all three of them have a romance where these teens are figuring out and having their own little teen melodrama. So it was, um, the book was published in 2008 and it was made into a movie that is on Netflix, I think in 2019 or so. Um, I have seen the movie, the movie's, it's different and strange, but again, if you like the, you know, holiday feel good rom-com kind of teen side of things, this book does it. I really enjoyed it for those things. It's a good book to read, like when it's snowy and you want to feel the cold. Um, I guess this would be a good book for like a weather topic. Um, cause you can feel the sense of like the blizzard and like this closeness that comes about like having to all seek solace in this waffle house. So that is my loosely food-based book called Let It Snow by John Green, Lauren Miracle, and Maureen Johnson. Uh, Christopher, what did you bring for us to eat? Well, I happened on a very interesting book. It is told through a series of dozens and dozens of very short little chapters each one with the title of some kind of a food. It's Toast by Nigel Slater. And it's both a memoir and his life through food. So Slater had a very difficult, kind of horrible childhood with a mother that died of asthma when he was a little boy and a father who was temperamental at best and inscrutable, and then a new stepmother. Uh, the book takes place in the 60s and early 70s in England. Uh, one cool thing about the book is that there are lots and lots and lots of descriptions of foods that I've never heard of. 
all kinds of brands and my favorite English food, hundreds and thousands, which is English or British English for what we call sprinkles. Uh, so that's a really fun kind of light part of the book. But the book is kind of heavy. Um, each chapter is about something food related in his life, but it often ends with something really strange happening or something sad happening. And then the author withholds all the information that the reader is so desperately looking for, like, why did this happen? What's going on behind the scenes? Uh, you know, what does it all mean? And it gives you the sense of being a child in an adult's world where all the decisions are being made and you have no volition or ability to affect anything and you can't even ask why this is going on. So I really appreciated that part of the book. An example of that is in one scene, uh, Slater as a little boy is beaten by his father quite severely. And later on, he sees his father crying out in the greenhouse. And then the chapter ends. And there's no more reflection about that scene. There's no more internal discussion of what it meant for his father to be crying after his father beat him so badly. So, you know, it's it puts the reader a bit uh, off kilter. Um, but I think the effect is very interesting. It's like, that's what it's like to be a child in an adult's world. And so I really appreciated that, that aspect of it a lot. Um, so the book really follows Slater's whole life, his childhood and then into adulthood and his positions with food and um, how his life all ends up. Um, so it's not such a cheery story by any means. Uh, and I didn't always sympathize with the author, which was also interesting for me. I thought that all these childhood stories would make me just purely sympathetic to him, but sometimes he's kind of rascally and kind of um, self-centered, like when he complains about having to do the washing up after every meal, it's like, <laughs> you know, uh, lots of kids have lots of chores. And I suspect he comes from a slightly different class than I did growing up. Um, so anyway, it was very interesting. Uh, I really did enjoy the book. And that is Toast by Nigel Slater. Anyone have any parting thoughts about food? Or are we all going in to get lunch now? <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds great. We will see you next time for another episode of Bibliophiles. Take care.